today on Call Out, a late night mission turns strange for Penticton and Nelson's search and rescue when the surviving witness is cuffed on an outstanding arrest warrant. Can you tell me what your, your friend was wearing when you went in? And later, Canadian Forces Sartex in training brave their first parachute jump on Canadian soil. Basically, we're, we're trying to get them down the path where they can jump anywhere in Canada. Saturday, 11.30 p.m. Members from Penticton Search and Rescue brace themselves for a potential all-nighter. Just a few hours earlier, a man was reported missing in the West Kettle River. He and his friend were paddling down the fast-flowing waters without life jackets when their canoe flipped. His friend made it to shore and called 911. Yeah, that's where, that's where the second team is starting. The team has traveled two hours to reach the site and cannot afford to waste another minute. They head straight to the spot where the canoe reportedly flipped. Call the tip out. What do you see? At first glance, the river looks very calm, a class one river, something that you would find a, a group of people tubing down. However, as the search progresses, the true nature of the river's dangers will be revealed. Walking along the path, they find a message left by the subject's friend, directing him to safety should he make it out of the river. Down by the water, they spot the canoe. We then decided that we wanted to search further downriver. As late as it was since the time of the incident, we were still hoping to find him alive. Believing that the missing subject may simply be lost in the dark, the team drives along the river, flooding the valley with searchlights. But not far downstream, a disheartening discovery. That is a huge gradient drop. That just says bad day for a swim. Anything going in there will be held underwater and pummeled by the raging waters. At that point, we realized that we were probably not looking for uh, a live subject anymore. We were probably going to be looking for a deceased person. It's simply too dark and too dangerous to justify searching the river. As the sun begins to rise, they return to base, exhausted, but still determined. We're all gonna head home for about four hours of shut-eye. Uh, Nelson Search and Rescue has been requested to assist us in our ongoing river search. Five hours later, Nelson Saar is en route, but they won't be joined by Penticton Saar, who have been tasked with another call out. Penticton Search and Rescue had been called away to a major landslide, so I was unable to get any information from them. I had to re interview the subject. Black pants, he had a leather belt, and white running shoes. But to do so, Chris has to visit the local jail where the surviving canoeist is under arrest after escaping the raging river. I don't need to know the circumstances of what they were doing or how they were doing it. What I need to know is the point last seen. I need to know what equipment they had on. They had a PFD, no PFD. Every article of clothing that that person may have had on. All of this information is gonna help us locate the subject. Did you see where the canoe went? Uh, it just went down the river, it's upside down. There was one thing that was a bit puzzling. The witness had said that they had flipped on a wave on river left. And the canoe the night before was found on river right. For the canoe to travel from river left to river right, it had to cross current laterally. This doesn't happen naturally. But when you interview subjects, how they remember it may not always be how it happened. We have to look at this logically and move forward with the evidence we have. Having gathered all the relevant information, Specially trained swift water technicians from the Nelson and South Columbia SAR teams head to the West Kettle River. So it's quite a canyon these guys swam through here. There's only a couple of catchment spots that I can see. It'll take a few hours to access this stuff. Probably have to swim across the river, probably put a boat in. 
With so many pockets to search, they split up into smaller units to perform a river-wide sweep. It has now been 16 hours since the incident was reported. They're looking for both the missing subject and his canoe, which had dislodged from its position overnight. It's a really good spot to find our subject. If he's uh, come down this section of river, he's gonna spend time or stay right in this big eddy. Most of it's kind of overhung with cliffs, so we've got some guys going down, jump in on tether, gonna swim around in there with a snorkel and mask and see if we can find the subject. It's a really big, big river here. Pretty awesome. If there is a body in a river, it will usually end up in an eddy, a calm spot formed behind obstructions that are protected from the current's pull. For us, the only way to search it is by snorkel a mask or drop camera. If we can't see them there, the only thing left is to bring in the RCMP dive team. Using an avalanche probe, you can feel the difference between rock, wood, sand, and you will know when you found the subject. What are we doing, Al? We're doing a uh, systematic tethered search of this log jump, Chris. You guys found anything yet? No, we haven't. All right, man, get at her. Right. Sheila! They found him. So the other team has just whistled to us on the leading edge of the main uh, log jam where the canoe is actually lodged. We found the subject. So we're gonna head back over there with the cataract right now and see if we can figure out a way to extricate. The team regroups at the location. They recover the canoe and soon realize that all is not as it seems. We found almost all items reported to us. Items from their lunch, clothing that the subject had, almost everything but the subject himself. False alarm. So it turned out not to be the subject. They've uh, moved some logs to try to extricate and realized it was a, uh, a white shirt, which is probably the subject's shirt, and uh, some other debris that really fooled them, basically. Downstream, the river becomes flatter and wider. Chris decides to proceed on rafts. We're uh, just running down the uh, river right now in a cataract, stopping at every log jam and every eddy and having a good eyeball. This river goes a long ways from here, very straight, not a whole lot of catchments. The log jams will start getting less and less now that we're away from a lot of the gradient drops, so probably not gonna find them, but uh, we're pretty hopeful. The team travels 32 kilometers downstream before reluctantly calling it a day. Short of getting divers into that canyon, which just isn't gonna happen, it's too deep, too dangerous. I think we've done all we can do. If he's not there, or he's down someplace where we can't get him. Two weeks later, a couple of teenagers tubing in the West Kettle River get the shock of their lives when they come across a deceased male. The body is pinned under a heavy log, about 34 kilometers downstream from where the incident occurred. Apparently the uh, subject has been found about two kilometers downstream from our last search area where we took out the boats. So we're responding right now back to the area, get them recovered this afternoon. Along with the Nelson and Penticton members, also present are Grand Fork Search and Rescue, the RCMP, and the coroner. Just throw it up on the wood, give it to Al, and then we'll walk up and be safe about it. Our team knew going into this recovery that this calm looking water was extremely dangerous. A majority of that powerful current was going directly underneath this log jam. If we were to fall through, we could easily become entrapped. Our subject had been carried all the way down the river. The current had taken him underneath this log jam. Two weeks had passed, and he had risen to the surface and become entrapped under a piece of wood.
The subject is later identified by the coroner as the missing canoeist. Cause of death, blunt force trauma to the head. Though this is consistent with traveling down a river of such magnitude, foul play has not been ruled out. But for search and rescue volunteers, only one thing matters. The subject has been found. We did a very intensive search of 32 kilometers of river. As it turns out, the subject was found only two kilometers downstream from where we stopped. You just never know when that extra mile or kilometer is gonna make the difference. Now, Canadian Forces Sartec rookies learn to leap to the rescue. It's a pretty, uh, pretty frightening experience the first time, so. For people lost or injured in Canada's vast wilderness, sometimes their only hope will be the Canadian Forces search and rescue technicians. These elite rescue specialists go into Canada's harshest and most remote environments to provide medical aid and extraction. To become qualified search and rescue technicians, recruits must undergo 11 months of rigorous training, including primary care paramedic certification, mountain climbing, scuba diving, sea operations, and Arctic survival and rescue. This afternoon, free fall, same skin as yesterday, okay? Be Today, in their seventh month of training, these 13 Sartec trainees are tackling the challenging para phase, a seven-week course that will shape them into expert parachutists. Jumping out at 13,000 feet. It's a pretty, uh, pretty frightening experience the first time. So. No! As soon as they give you that go, you just take a deep breath and just leave. No! There's a few that had a couple civilian jumps, but we're going to take them down a path to something that civilians don't do at all. So. Arms up! Take a spot on the ground! For an experienced Sartec, Jumping out of a plane is second nature. Basically, the ultimate goal for an operational SARTEC is to get on that fixed wing aircraft, deploy anywhere to help those people in distress and to parachute into anything. So that could be ocean, it could be trees, it could be the high Arctic. Basically, that's, that's our main means of getting anywhere. Paraphase jumping begins in Arizona, where the trainees make their introductory leaps from 5,000 feet into large drop zones. Let's go! first week is all static line jumping into a great big field so we have lots of room for bad things to happen and we're also radio controlling them so we'll talk them down for their first uh, three to six jumps depending on how they're doing the goal here is familiarization and confidence building not style and precision you okay jumper it's awesome yeah <laughs> Sartex use high-performance semi-elliptical parachutes known as ram air canopies. Unlike traditional round parachutes that simply drop the jumper straight down, ram air canopies provide lift and act like an airplane wing. The canopy flies just like an aircraft would. If they want to turn right, they pull in a right toggle and it deflects the right side of the canopy and, and it steers. They can flare the canopy, they can stall it, slow it right down, like put in deep brake attitude so that it's actually more just floating and getting vertical descent versus the 20 knot of horizontal drive. Over the course of the para phase, the Sartex will learn two modes of skydiving, free fall and static line. In a free fall jump, the flyer exits the aircraft at high altitude and drops for a period of time before activating the parachute. In a static line jump, the parachute is rigged to the aircraft and is automatically deployed upon exit. On an actual mission, fully operational Sartex typically leap at lower altitudes, therefore requiring static line jumps. No matter what mode they're using, they're constantly jumping during training. They'll jump back to back to back so that they get saturation training that way. But of course, before they can even start any of that stuff, they get all their theory as far as canopy piloting and the, and the theory of flight behind the canopy itself. And then obviously they have to learn how to pack it before they can actually jump. The first static line, the static line is the longest configuration. There's a lot of steps. It took me about 
an hour and a half, an hour and 45 minutes for the first shoot. Now we are in about the 45 minute range, 45 to an hour, depending. Parachute packing is carried out with the utmost attention. Packed in properly, the parachute could malfunction. As backup, all parachutes are equipped with a reserve canopy in case something does go wrong. Today, with over 50 jumps under their belt in fairly easy, wide open areas, the Sartek students are ready to start their confined space jumps, part of the level two training in paraphase. And level two means uh, parachuting into the water or the ocean uh, at night in the small confined areas. The more nastier jumping, the little harder to get to areas. The target schedule for today is particularly nasty. The wing commander's confined area, a clearing that is 250 by 150 meters, framed on all sides by soaring trees. It's probably one of the most challenging in this area. It's not the size, it's the trees that are in there. The trees there are up to 100 meters high, which makes it very deceiving for a parachuter to look down and try and judge distance and depth and stuff like that. As the parachutist approaches the landing area, the height of the trees creates the illusion that the ground is closer than it actually is. To clear the trees and still make the landing, he has to adjust his angle of descent, path, and speed. One of my friends, he landed in these trees. His canopy didn't hang up, and you could see how far he fell. He spent the next couple weeks in uh, Vancouver General Hospital, getting his back put together again. To complicate matters, confined areas like this one often create unpredictable air currents. Landings are preferably executed into the wind, but Sartex are often forced to alter their approach and adapt to the restricted size and shape of the landing zone. A sudden drop in wind speed can cause a Sartex to overshoot the target area and crash right into a wall of trees. We can see an opening right here, so what happens is the air is spilling in here in a nice open area, but when the the air drops down or the wind decreases, you'll see the flags will change and this turns into like a toilet bowl where the winds are unpredictable and they can have downdrafts. And then if you hit that downdraft, it can collapse your canopy and you'll actually hit the ground pretty good. So it's a pretty serious confined area. Yeah, he's waving. Sartex will jump in a team of two. Usually the low guy will spiral down like this guy is and that's just to make sure we don't congest the final approach into a confined area. If a guy is stacked together with the other guy too closely, it'll cause problems. Get that nice separation in. See this guy's coming down pretty aggressively, getting some sachets in. And now he's on a downwind leg. He's looking for an area to land right now, judging the winds. He's noticing he's high right now. You'll probably see him do a couple of left and right turns and he'll stay right on the edge of the barrier. You never want to go back beyond the barrier, just in case the winds pick up, and he'll actually be blown into the trees that way, so. Now he's on final, he's letting his canopy fly. If there's any turbulent wind, you want to make sure you're not pulling any slips, so that's what he's doing is ideal. Now he's flaring it out, and it's a great landing. So the second guy's coming in now. And that was a really good stack. You see those guys landed well together. The trainees swoop down, one after the other. They all successfully land inside the target area, though not without a few hiccups. And anytime he should be turning final. And he's really close to the trees. And he's over him now. For Corporal Guitard, a little too close for comfort. Scare yourself? A little bit. Yeah, that's good. It's uh, became faster than I thought. Life lessons are a wonderful thing. Yeah. Now you have a practical experience to, yeah. to relate to for the next one. They're a real keen group of guys. They're probably one of the only courses that have shown up here with very minimal parachuting experience. They're doing stuff like this now. Guys are jumping into small confined areas and making good landings long long way from uh, jumping into a big big grass field down in Arizona get up in the morning and you go to work and you say I'm going to jump out of planes 
doesn't get better than that. Okay, I'm happy with what I saw today. Beautiful awesome. pattern today. These students may be in the final leg of paraphase training, but the instructors will continue throwing challenges at them until the very last day. So really good use of the actual drop zone in your terrain for sure. Like all Sartex, these trainees must be prepared to jump anywhere, anytime to help those in need of medical assistance. We're assessing how good their ability is at this time, and then we'll aggressively make it more complex. At the end of it, basically we're, we're trying to get them down the path where they can jump anywhere in Canada. In the next call out, the rookie Sartex practice jumping from low altitudes, where they quickly learn that at 1,500 feet from the ground, there's no room for error. Call out search and rescue features and real stories filmed live by search and rescue teams during actual missions. Find out more at calloutsar.tv.